Welcome this afternoon to our webinar, um, the second in our series called Implementing a Virtual Vault with Auto Classification. Uh, my name is Jen Nelson. I'm the VP of Marketing and Business Development at Aurora Technologies. And also with me is Sandy Serkis, who you will know from previous webinars. She is the, uh, a co-founder and the CEO of Aurora Technologies. So I'd like to welcome everyone uh, today. Uh, a little plug for our 2021 webinar series. Um, this is the second I mentioned uh, in our series. So we've got one happening about every four to six weeks or so. Um, this is 2020 or 2019. Um, our previous uh, webinar series kind of gave a foundation or implement um, fundamentals to auto classification. And this webinar series takes a big a big deep dive into kind of each um, different part of auto classification and its use cases. So today is virtual vault, and I invite you to go on the web and um, register for any upcoming if they uh, if they pique your interest. So um, let's just jump right into the agenda. Um, before we do, I just want to say we are pretty easy going, and uh, we. Uh, welcome questions and answers um, as we go. We'll, we may save them to the end, but we'll interrupt each other and, uh, and answer those questions as we go. So, so don't hesitate to, uh, to put those questions into the little chat box and we'll, we'll answer them. So let's just jump right in. Um, first, uh, we're gonna do a bit of an introduction and a refresh just on auto classification in general. And then we're gonna dive into what is a virtual vault? How is it gonna help companies? How do I implement one? How does it work? And we're actually, we've got some live data set up in our environment. So we're gonna actually have a look at what that live data looks like in a virtual vault environment. And um, we're gonna go through case studies. We've got uh, two major player um, clients who we are profiling and we're going to take you through each of kind of the four phases, what their big challenge was, what their objectives or goals were for this project, um, their strategy and implementation and how we approached the problem and the results of each of these um, uh, each of these clients projects. So we will uh, we'll jump right in. OK, so let's just give a bit of a recap and a refresh and intro on Valora technology. So um, Valora, we are an auto classification platform that allows businesses to find, identify, and move or action different content um, in the enterprise environment. We have uh, technology, so this is kind of our, our SaaS platform. It's enterprise grade, it is secure, and you're gonna see everything in a single platform. We're gonna show you a little bit about that today. Um, we also bring our expertise to the table. We have a team of in-house professional services and project managers that, um, that help guide clients through that process our best practices in implementing and launching um, auto classification projects and, and practices um, through a proven process. We're quite proud of that. Um, we also bring experience. So um, Sandy has you know, co-founded the company over 20 years ago and in that time has really helped um, kind of bring auto classification to where it is today. Um, with our thousands of clients that we've worked with, we've you know, processed over 44 billion different files. So there's not much that we haven't seen. And we bring that, that history and that experience to our clients. And our customers, you're gonna find yourselves here as we just kind of did our poll, um, mostly in, in industries that have a lot of content. So highly regulated industries like financial services and pharma, um, some big global corporations, and we'll actually see one um, today in our case study, a global technology company, um, and legal in-house uh, outsourced law firms, and then clearinghouse. And we say clearinghouse like data processors or data aggregators, anyone who's dealing with processing a lot of other people's content. So uh, Auto Classification 101, just a refresher, what is it? It is a software platform that allows for the analysis and decision-making of content. So it's taking rich metadata and rules. It takes the file metadata. It also applies the rich metadata. So there's kind of the attributes of the file content. And Sandy will talk about that in a little minute. Um, and then it applies recognition algorithms. So once we know what it is, it determines the doc type. We don't care if it's a Word doc or a PDF. What we care about is the doc type. So is it a contract or an agreement? Um, it will do the automated, 
of the automated index and tagging um, of those uh, of those tags to determine the doc type, and then it will actually do something with it. So once it knows what it is and what to do with it, it will actually automate the process of that. It's not just going to tell you. Um, and the rules typically follow a nested if then format. So if it's this, do that. If it's this and this and this, then do that. And it can be as simple or as complex as we need them to be. Our auto classification um, suite is called Powerhouse and it's built on the engine of the auto classification engine. And this is the beast that crawls and locates. It does all that, um, all that hard work and automating all of that. It applies the rich metadata tags. It is uh, flexible in its uh, deployment. It, it is cloud-based, but we can do um, on-prem or hybrid if need be. And so that's kind of the part that you're not gonna see. And we're not gonna see that today when, when Sandy shows us the, um, the virtual vault example. But what we are going to see is Black Hat. And that's the metadata management platform. This is kind of the user friendly interface that an end user would come and view reports and manipulate data and look to see what we have. And then the third is QCUI, which is a quality control user interface. So these are for, for um, heavy data teams um, with lots of services behind there who need to get in and augment and manage some of the metadata that is, um, that is on each file. So that's kind of where, um, where we sit for our technology suite. And we're going to see that today, Black Hat. Now, before I pass it off to Sandy, I just wanted to give um, and for those folks who we've already spoken to um, either in a meeting or in another webinar, you've seen this slide before that kind of talks about the complexity uh, and the real, the real challenge when it comes to managing enterprise content. Um, so we have data silos and it, it's really much more than saying we have you know, stuff everywhere because we all kind of do, but it's the data formats and the data environments that make it challenging, both with a combination of cloud-based systems that we have and on-prem systems. We have stuff sitting in structured databases, um, which is great, but the real challenge is that all that unstructured stuff that's sitting on a, a shared drive. We've got hard drives, we've got laptops, we've got microfiches, we've got tapes, we've got a lot of place that, you know, content is kind of um, gone and either we're actively using it or it's kind of gone to die. So um, in those environments, we have those formats um, and these are the document formats. So the easy stuff like the text and the Word docs, um, some PDFs and whatever, but then we've got you know, content sitting in emails and attachments and audio and visual files and specialty formats, and then formats that aren't in English. So anything that's um, that's outside of English, an end user has a difficult time trying to understand what is being said. So we've got this kind of environment and land of data. And then we have the people who wake up and use it every day. We've got the custodians being, you know, kind of legal, HR, IT, CISO, and then everybody who comes to work every day and creates all this content. And most of this content is, when it is created, it meets a multiple of needs. And people are gonna have to you know, keep it for part of legal hold. People are gonna have to keep it to archive it. People are gonna have to send it to legal. People are gonna have to keep it for sales. So the data custodians and the data needs, there's this kind of gap between what I need and what I'm looking for. And that's where Valora sits, is kind of in between where it lives and when I need it and acts as this traffic cop um, between what's being shown and when. And the, the beauty of it is bringing all of this content into one single pane of glass view. And that's what we're gonna talk about today with a virtual vault, being able to see and manage many documents, regardless of location, in one um, view, so that we're able to search those data, data facets and the metadata based on what the document is. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass this over to Sandy. Let me know if you can take control of that. Um, let me just make sure that I'm starting in the right place. Yes, I am. Um, and I have to show my share my screen now. Oh, you have to allow me to, Jen. Oh. So I stopped. You should be able to. Wait, I'm going to make you host. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And I'm going to do that. Can you guys see my screen now? We can see it. 
Okay, so um, first of all, thank you, Jen, for that nice overview, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, we're going to be talking today about a virtual vault, as Jen said, and I'm going to just transition us now from kind of generic auto classification into what makes a virtual vault. So when we talk about file metadata, I know there are some people here that have kind of an e-discovery background, um, and metadata in e-discovery tends to be very limited. It's usually file metadata, the stuff that you see here. Um, auto classification brings a whole lot of additional information. You might call that tags, metadata, classification, categorization, but basically it's additional attributes about each piece of content. These are just examples of the kind of depth that auto classification goes to. Um, this is in the sort of generic sense. Then when we start to look at a virtual vault, which is again, this kind of consolidated single pane of glass that's looking across multiple repositories, usually for some kind of purpose. It might be, today we're gonna to talk about two, we're gonna talk about um, multiple acquisitions as the purpose, and we're gonna talk about kind of claims litigation preparation as the second. So what you tend to see in a virtual vault is this need to aggregate content, not really, but conceptually, virtually, to aggregate content for a purpose. So most uh, virtual vaults will have what I call the usual suspect, this type of rich metadata, um, that's kind of shared across the board. Then we get into some more specifics. When we have a contracts, I'll say database, although it isn't really, it's a virtual database, um, you're going to see things that are related to contracts. What type of contract? What is the nature of this contract? Who are the parties? Who signed it? What are the you know, important dates I care about? All of this becomes database attributes without actually having to store the contract itself. Same thing with M&A. Um, what do you need to know about M&A? Well, you know, which acquisition did this come from? Which employee is this for? Um, the one we're going to talk about today is specific to HR-oriented M&A activity. Um, and another big thing that comes up with M&A is because you're inheriting the content from other organizations, you have this merging or integrating of uh, records policies. So that plays a big role in M&A. You'll see some of that. Um, and then HR in general, um, all the things, this very common use of a virtual vault is to put, uh, again, conceptually put all of the HR information together, even though it isn't physically, um, so that you can track everything related to an employee name. Maybe you are running a data subject access request under GDPR. Maybe there's a litigation matter. Um, whatever it is you need to kind of organize around an HR agenda, that would be an HR virtual vault. So these are examples of virtual vaults. And they are becoming more and more necessary. Um, a, a prior Valora client kind of coined the phrase and we really liked it. Um, and it, because it really adequately uh, defines what's happening. And we're getting more and more requests for this kind of thing because content just continues to accumulate. There's a lot more, you know, kind of M&A and, and, and business relationship activity. So content is increasingly sort of strewn all over. Jen also mentioned that there are things in the cloud, on-prem, people, now that we're all working from home, you can see my home back here. Um, we just have kind of content coming at us all over the place. And there is a, a strong need to kind of organize and sort of throttle it for a lot of different purposes. That is essentially the definition of the virtual ball. Okay, so how does it work? Um, there's a sequence of steps. I can't remember whether it's five or six. Um, basically what happens is um, we set up Powerhouse, that's the system, to crawl uh, whatever the data sources are. So it might be um, crawling the back end of Exchange for email. It might be crawling um, some kind of custom database. It might be crawling a file share to go and say, all right, what is this? What is this? It's almost like kind of a, a automated cleanup uh, that says, what do we have here? Um, and so Powerhouse will go through, kind of figure out where things are, what they are at a kind of high level. Usually document type is where we start. Um, and just so everybody knows, document type is like, it doesn't mean it's a JPEG. A JPEG could be anything, that's a file extension. When we say document type, we mean it's a contract, it's a sales forecast, 
It's a hospital admission form, something like that. Um, and we start there and then we get more details. So, okay, uh, it's a contract, but what exactly is, you know, is inside here? Who are the parties? What is this contract about? What are various types of clauses that I am going to be concerned with? And then once I have all of that information, essentially a DNA sequenced every file, okay, now what do I do with this? It's a contract, but we no longer do business with such and such company. Can I remove this document? Um, okay, it's an email from an employee who's no longer in this organization, but we're in litigation with them. Okay, we're gonna have, you know, that, that email is under legal hold. So how long do I keep it? Where do I keep it? Who should have access? How sensitive is that content? Those are the decision kind of vectors. And then finally, um, nothing ever sits still naturally. The content doesn't sit still. The businesses don't sit still. And of course, regulatory environments don't sit still. So there's a constant perpetual, what we would call data under management, um, analysis of what has been accumulated so far, what is continuing to accumulate, and then the larger context of what's going on. Because even if you looked at a document three years ago, the context may be different today. That may suddenly be relevant or important or no longer needed. So we are what we call delta monitoring. We're monitoring whatever has changed. So that is kind of the technique. Um, and now I'm going to take you on a bit of a deep dive on literally how does it work. So um, this is sort of a conceptual view. Um, what is uh, happening is that we are creating a text rendition of the content if there isn't one already. Um, so that would be using either text extraction from native ESI or um, OCR. Um, where necessary, we're auto translating um, and uh, auto transcribing as well. And essentially diving in and using various types of pattern matching, machine learning, AI to say, what is this? Oh, here's a data facet. This is a uh, agreement and it's between party A and party B. So those are, you know, the fact that it's an agreement, the type of agreement, the title, uh, party A, party B, signatory A, signatory B, effective date, all of those become data facets. And so each one of those is kind of captured like a little checklist and can then be used to manipulate the, the content for various purposes. So maybe you want to sequester out certain types of content because it's sensitive. Maybe you want to delete certain types of content because it's completely obsolete. Maybe you want to bring forward certain types of content because it's germane in this litigation. So there are all different reasons and rationales of how and why you might want to use those data facets. So let's take an actual one. This is an agreement. Um, you can tell because it says this agreement. Um, and using, again, that textual analysis, um, auto classification is going to start to pull out those important DNA bits. So, okay, I can see it's a contract. I know the document type, contract, agreement. I can find an effective date. I can find parties, keywords, various terms and clauses. One of the things that often takes place here is an extraction either in full or as a kind of a summary of the various types of clauses. So you'll look for things like a confidentiality clause or a term or renewal um, or, you know, kind of sales uh, percentages. You know, again, it depends on the client. Um, but these are the types of clauses that might get pulled out. When I say pulled out, I mean captured as a tag available into the Virtual Vault database. Nothing happens to the original document. <laughs> um, Keywords, etc. So whatever else might be in this particular file, as well as uh, kind of related to it, a lot of people store what I'll call supporting information, um, exhibits, addenda, um, emails that are transmitting information or might have some um, information around the contracts. All of those go into the virtual vault and are kind of fair game. And so then there's different types of disposition that might happen based on what this is. Okay, so let's take something that is a, a loose definition of a contract. This is an application. Um, when signed, it becomes a contract. So this is a, a URL. It's a, a typical kind of mortgage application for 
uh, uh, a home. And uh, what you, there's kind of two ways to think about how you might classify a contract. There's just the kind of meat and potatoes, what are the data elements? And that's what you'll see here. Um, this is just, you know, straight up, what, is, what are the data values for different types of uh, facets? And then again, each one of these becomes a field in the database, becomes a, a manipulable facet in the virtual vault. And then there's another reason you might want to go through something like this, which is private data privacy. There's a lot of sensitive information in here. We are talking about someone's home, their home address, their name, their social security number, and their phone number. And yes, this is all fake, in case you're wondering. Um, but in theory, uh, quite a bit of sensitive information in here. And so we want to be aware that there's PII present in this document. We probably want to not only know about that, but actually remediate that. So that's where you get into things like auto redaction, maybe suppressing different types of documents from searching, um, kind of integrating user classes, who can see what, who gets what returned on a search, uh, did it get the redacted view or the unredacted view, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those, a good virtual vault should accommodate for all of those situations, including one of my favorite things, which is what I call warning sign uh, sensitive data. This document becomes sensitive because of the type of document, the doc type, it's a, a residential mortgage, because there's an address and because it says title will be held in their name. So those three data points together make a PII situation. Even if none of this borrower information down here, even if that was all blank, this would still qualify as PII because you could reasonably put together Brady and Wilma, this address and a mortgage and assume that they do currently or are going to be living there. Okay, so we call PII warning sign. Um, in addition to obviously tons of clear PII all over the place. Okay, all right. So um, I'm assuming Jen, this is the point at which we go into the live demo, is that correct? Okay, you're on mute, but oh, I'm sorry, I'm on mute. Yes, yes, that is correct. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a screenshot of Black Hat. It's showing kind of the virtual vault, that single pane of glass uh, concept. And um, so we're going to go over and take a look at that right now. Um, so this is a sample virtual vault. There are all dummy documents in here. Um, and you can kind of see what a virtual vault looks like. Um, there's only a handful of documents just for this demo today. Um, but you can see each of these charts represents a different data facet from the content in the various contracts. So not surprisingly, you'll see things like, um, you know, jurisdiction and signatories and parties. And these are various clauses. Is there an auto renew clause? Is there a confidentiality clause? So what you're looking at here is the kind of dashboard view. I can drill down on any of these things. I move this goober. I can um, search on any of these properties, but I can also, I'm gonna just go in and show you one, and I'm gonna show you one, which is a mock document, Jen, <laughs> uh, between Jen and me, <laughs> uh, which is a non-disclosure agreement. So what you have here is a preview image of the documents. Um, it's not the actual one, although you can launch it. One of the nice things about a virtual vault is that you don't actually have to know where this document lives. If you've already logged in, we know who you are, we have your user credentials, we know what you are allowed to see and do and access. And so you can, uh, if you're seeing this, that means you're permitted to, and you can launch it if you need to. You don't have to remember which repository has this document it's just gonna like serve it up to you, bring it to you because you already have passed the permissions hurdle. So that's a really nifty feature. We don't have to keep traversing folder paths to get to the content. We can search and it is brought to us. And so what I'm looking at is an agreement and you'll notice across the top, this is the type of information that that auto classification puts on the table. Um, gives us a title, um, the type, the sort of nature of the contract, different types of clauses, term, the, this should say effective date if I scroll out a little bit, 
um, who the signatories are. And again, I can always search by that. So if I wanna see all business that we've conducted with Jennifer Nelson, I can literally search on her name or click on her name and be brought to the, the filtering that is she. And so there's a lot of value in having this, these attributes, yes for search, yes for retrieval, but also for actioning. So for example, um, you'll notice I have a, a field here for rot. Is any of this rot? Yes, we have a non-disclosure agreement from uh, 2015. It has a term of two years. It expires, this is the termination date, if I stretch that out, um, of 2017. That is obsolete. There is no reason for us to be keeping that document anymore. So we're now bridging the gap between kind of business line usage or legal usage and on into records and compliance usage and saying, oh, why are we hanging on to content that is obsolete, not under legal hold? There's no business value. We don't do business with that organization anymore. It's time to get rid of this defensively. This is a great way to do that uh, because it really uh, highlights immediately the content that can go and for various reasons. This one's obsolete. This one's trivial. Why is it trivial? Because it is an empty MNDA. It is not signed even by Valora in this case or anyone else. There's no real reason to keep this file. Um, this is, would be a good one. You know, how many of these empty ones? We might look at duplicates, okay? So a virtual vault is going to kind of track all of this information with that kind of purpose-driven, it's all about contracts as an example here. So Jen, I don't want to spend too much time on the demo because we have a lot of ground to cover, but I, of course, invite everybody on screen, um, if you would like a deeper dive demo, um, by all means, reach out to Jen or me and we'd be happy to give you that. So, okay, I'm going to put that back down and come back here. All right. So Jen, I'm going to flip this one back to you. This was your slide, so I'm going to let you speak to it. I'm happy to kind of lay the pictures out. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you be the clicker? Okay. Um, so uh, just before we get into the actual case study, so as we can see, the benefits of having and setting up a virtual vault, um, there are certainly a few. So the first is certainly productivity. Um, having everything in one spot saves time and effort of the person who is looking or searching for different documents. Um, accessibility, everything stays where it is. And as Sandy saw, we could see everything through one interface, regardless of where it lives. With the tagging and the applying of the metadata to each, um, each document and each interesting field, everything is organized. So it's streamlined and organized by those document attributes. And again, we can kind of slice and dice as we need to see the universe. Uh, permissioned. So whether or not, depending on my security classification or what I have access to see, we can take those um, security classifications and Vora, Black Cat, and Powerhouse will inherit those. So if I am allowed to see it, I'll be able to see it. If I'm not allowed to see it, it will be redacted as an example. And um, the automation. So everything is automated. Everything is, uh, again, when we talk about rules and the disposition of, those, of, of content, um, we can decide what needs to happen with those and we can automate that decision making, which is um, helpful when you're working with a big group. Again, Sandy mentioned the perpetualness of this. So every time a new document is created, every time a, an existing document is edited, it will uh, look for that, apply any new data facets um, or metadata tags, and it will update everything as it happens. Um, second to last one here, the notifications. So um, you're not working in a bubble here. There, it's a very collaborative um, effort. And we can, you know, if we have a, a follow on meeting for this, perhaps with a demo, we'll show you the collaboration between um, team members and organizations and departments where you can uh, be alerted. If there's new content created or processed or a decision needs to be made, um, you can be notified. And then the last one is it's defensible. Every action, every decision that's made, everything that is created or removed or um, every decision is defensible. It's, uh, it's tracked and you can report on that so that everything's, um, everything's above board. So just a few uh, benefits there of a virtual vault. And so now when we move into case studies, I'm gonna pass this back over to Sandy um, to talk about these two case studies. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about two different case studies today. These are real world solutions, um, but both of them very near and dear to my heart. Um, this first one is a global technology company operating in pretty much every country you could name. Uh, they've been around a long time. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of dive right in. They have grown over the years through strategic acquisition. That is a, a very active area for them, M&A. Um, they've done 140 acquisitions in the last 20 years. And most of the time, um, while they were acquiring whatever organization, usually for its technology or its customer base, they, of course, inherit everything that comes along with that acquisition. And so the group that we are working with is essentially an M&A task force that is involved in onboarding the content that is received through each acquisition. Um, and the immediate need is a kind of HR need. Um, they have, they were, they are the recipients of the incoming personnel information, HR information from each acquisition. And so what you have is a really gnarly problem, right? These were formerly independent organizations. Everybody kind of runs their systems their own way. They organize and store data their own way. They have their own retention policies. Some of them didn't have any. Um, and now they're kind of being brought under one roof and having to integrate with one another. And now the, the acquiring company, of course, is responsible for the content and the management of that content that they are acquiring. Um, and there's usually a very specific date, you call an LEC date, at which point that has taken hold. There's, there's no turning back. And so um, there's quite a lot of uh, concern about in Reporting this kind of information. Uh, HR information is very sensitive. It's voluminous. It, it covers uh, all kinds of act business activity. Um, one of the first things that we did, just to give people an example, was not just understand each piece of content and what employee it might cover. Of course, we did that. But also to uh, distinguish between were they just a contractor or an actual employee or, or the fun ones? They were a contractor and then an employee and then a contractor again. Why does that matter? Because the records retention is different whether the person was an employee or a contractor. A gnarly difficult problem. Um, and that's just, you know, and then each organization has their own version of the same. So there's quite a bit of kind of influx of information that really needed to be brought under control. Um, more importantly, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this organization because they have a, a very strong information governance group and they had put together uh, governance audits so that each of the business areas, including this um, M&A group, um, would have to perform audits on their handling of sensitive data and records. Um, needless to say, they were not passing those audits and this was a real issue. Um, for any of you out there, um, we'll get into this at the end, but I'll just put a, a pin in it now. If you are looking to get buy-in in your organizations around information governance activities and tools and spending, um, setting up an audit program is a spectacular way to do that because it really does highlight where the gaps are and what is not being properly uh, managed efficiently in your organization. So we could probably do a whole webinar on, on audits. <laughs> Okay, um, and so the objectives, as I said, is bring everything under one roof, make them all searchable for kind of the dual efforts of HR day-to-day -day needs, which were really almost subordinate to legal needs. Um, and then um, the kind of uh, records management, life cycle management needs as well. And so we really were um, kind of making three different groups happy. Um, the IG objectives, again, records management typically and disposition. The HR objectives of being able to find everything they need related to so-and-so or related to this acquisition or this type of policy. And then, of course, the legal objectives, because legal was very, very concerned that all this data had accumulated over 20 years and really didn't kind of belong to anyone. There was no responsibility. And so that is uh, kind of what was underlying all of this. Um, we began, and this is, this is very common, we highly recommend it, we began with a pilot. We took one acquisition, which was of course the biggest one. Um, it was a monster. And we um, tagged it for all kinds of important data facets, again, across legal HR and information governance. 
and then built this customized interface similar to what you saw a moment ago in Black Hat with dashboards, with different types of reporting, with different types of access and authorizations, and put it through a rigorous client acceptance process. They are, after all, a technology company, so they were pretty strong on that front. Um, and what we would call last mile workflow is making sure every file meets the objectives that are required. Um, and then ultimately, whoops, um, kind of moving from the single acquisition into all the rest of them. Um, so what they have gotten is a fully tagged searchable database. Everything is in there in a way that was just not there before. All they could do was just globally search and hope that things came up. They have this single pane of glass that they use all the time. Um, they got their ROI back on the one uh, pilot, on the just the pilot acquisition. Another trick for those of you looking to build ROI, find a really good pilot and the rest of it is gravy. Um, many other groups in this organization were watching this and have kind of queued up, say, oh, do our data, do our data, because in the MA, it wasn't just, it's not just HR data that is received. Next in line is finance, then marketing, et cetera. So using the MA as a, as a kind of leg up, um, we are now able to look at the content that's coming in from all of the different departments. Um, on this particular, the 140, just full disclosure, about two thirds of the way through, we're almost done. And we're about to get into that steady state, which starts in Q3 of perpetual monitoring, that data under management, so that all previous acquisitions will be managed and up to date, and all future acquisitions will kind of join their earlier brethren. So that is the status. Um, I will share with you a quote because, uh, I really liked it. Um, this is a direct quote out of the mouth of the, the head of HR. Um, and that is case study one. So Jen, I don't know, we didn't actually stop and ask for questions. I don't know if there are questions or anything. Yeah, you know what, I can't see any questions. I can see some chats in the in the little chat box, but I cannot see any questions. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the little Q&A bubble. Okay. okay. All right, in the meantime, we will go on to case study number two. Okay, uh, so we were just in the world of high tech, acquisitions, kind of an HR, HR bent, totally different. We are now in what we would call an energy joint venture, um, a number of kind of oil, gas, and energy companies coming together for an extremely ambitious uh, kind of construction, multi-year construction project. Um, We'll dive right in. Uh, be, like for those of you who have worked on construction litigation, you know that that is quite complex. Um, they, they are there's just tons and tons of documentation that goes along with construction, um, and it's it's very jargony, uh, very industry specific. Um, this is hard stuff. You know, it's one thing to analyze an email; it's quite another to analyze a construction related you know work order. Um, so that is the nature of the stuff that we were talking about here. This particular consortium stores content in about three or four different uh, repositories that literally have nothing to do with each other, like blueprints and kind of construction activity over here, correspondence is over there, um, contractual stuff is in yet another one. Um, and what they need to do on a regular basis, a daily basis, is to kind of look across so that when they have a topic of interest or a litigation matter or a claim, that they can kind of see the state of the world across all these data silos. And so what we're helping them do is kind of have that, again, that central pane of glass, that virtual vault that is sort of like a meta vault of all the other stuff. Now we're not storing a second copy of information. This is where we're a little bit different than what I think is typical e-discovery practice. We, there's no need to store a second copy of everything. We are able to see the original copy, the live copy, and that content is in use, um, and provide this analysis and kind of centralized view without having to store a second copy of data. It's a much more efficient, lower cost, um, smart way of, of managing data. And it's kind of the future approach. Um, I obviously still deal a lot in e-discovery and I'm always on my e-discovery colleagues that why do you keep making copies of data when you can operate in this fashion? So that's the virtual part of the virtual vault. 
Okay, so here's what we did. <laughs> um, as I said, this is living content, um, very much in use by the folks performing the construction, very much in use by the legal uh, groups that are kind of overseeing and monitoring the behavior. Um, they needed to be able to get across all of it and quickly. Uh, one of the things that we have here for the techies out there is there's an Elasticsearch engine underlying this, which makes any query, any activity, there's, there's almost a million documents in here. Uh, in here, a million documents sort of under management, I need to start, stop saying that, um, that are able to be search returned in under two seconds on nearly any search. So it's really impressive to have the Elasticsearch underneath. Um, and it is being used for this, as I said, this sort of preemptive claims and litigation planning. So, uh, so for example, one of the new tags, this is why we sort of say there's always content under management, data under management. One of the newer um, issues that we are tagging for is COVID-19, which of course, you know, however many years ago when this effort started, that was not a word anyone used, it wasn't even a thing, but that has become a major issue in the management, the operation of this project, and almost certainly there's going to be litigation related to it. And so we are helping them pull together all that content that is kind of under the rubric of COVID-19 activity. And so similar to the other, we started with a phase one, a pilot, um, where we uh, did uh, an inventory kind of sampling from each of the initial repositories. Um, ultimately, that went very well. Now we have, you know, kind of all the content from all the repositories and more of it arriving every single day. Um, and then uh, identifying and tagging documents for lots of detail. This one's very contractually related. Um, data, kind of like the one I showed you in Black Hat, uh, where there's um, both information about contracts as well as correspondence. A lot of correspondence back and forth. Um, and so we are not only kind of working with unique document types, there's quite a bit of workflow that goes on with this client, um, as well as different types of reporting for regulatory purposes. So um, there are a lot of different use cases when you put a virtual vault together um, and you have that ability to kind of see into or see across, um, suddenly everybody wants to kind of pile onto that. Uh, because you can report out, because you can easily manage or search, you will find lots of use cases suddenly bolstering the ROI for having the virtual vault in the first place. Jen, I can see that there's some chat. I don't know if those are just questions. I do or... have a question for when. Oh, LEC. Um, uh, so an LEC is legal entity combination. In other words, it's the official date at which the two uh, parties in the M&A cease to exist as separate, that they are legally one, kind of like a marriage date. That's what LEC is. Cool. And uh, uh, open question in the Q&A is, what's the typical speed to scan or crawl an index, either gigabytes or terabytes, number of hours per day, and what dependencies would either slow or increase speed of the activity? That's an excellent question. Um, so, there, there's a lot of it depends that goes in there, but I'll give you the kind of rough rule of thumb first. As a rough rule of thumb, you want to use as a baseline uh, kind of performance measurement, half a gigabyte per processor hour. So what does that mean? Well, half a gigabyte, you know, um, and per processor hour is basically a function of how many processors are running. If I have 10 people mowing my lawn at once, they'll each they, they will be done 10 times faster than if I have one person mowing my lawn. Same thing here. So I have processors that are processing. The more processors I have, the faster I can get through the content with each one running at roughly a half a gigabyte per processor hour. So that's how that works. One of the things that we do, um, certainly when we're piloting, but also in day-to-day in -day operation is that we are benchmarking performance to see how fast are we able to perform XYZ task. Um, and what we, so again, half gigabyte per processor hour is a, is a good kind of baseline. If you are not looking for 700 fields of data, uh, if your content is relatively clean and small each file, then you're gonna whip through much faster than that. 
If everything you have is a 17,000 page document full of graphics, um, it's gonna go slower. And you want, you know, you want 80 fields uh, on every page, that's gonna go slower. So we will usually benchmark that for you, but the half a gigabyte per processor hour is a really good just kind of ballpark. Um, and then um, in terms of load, so I gave you some examples of what are more taxing. Larger documents are, and I mean, I mean like really large, um, are more taxing. Um, having to analyze for hundreds of fields is more taxing. Um, and then depending on whether uh, we can crawl your systems 24 seven, or if you wanna throttle that because they're in use, or you don't want the, the, the load, uh, let's say over your, your, uh, your bandwidth or something like that, um, Powerhouse is very respectful of that and can be throttled. So obviously that would slow things down. These are all the details that we would work out with you, um, you know, kind of in, in an implementation scenario. Any more, Jen? Cool. No, nope, that's it for now. Okay. Um, so let's get to the results. Um, this uh, system is in use by about 30 people every day. Um, started out as a small group. And as I said, people tend to pile on when they see the easy access and the easy control of this type of content. Um, these, these groups have, have really uh, done that, uh, both implementing within larger groups within the single organization, as well as starting to incorporate now outside counsel, consultants, again, sort of third party activities. Um, and those are the kinds of groups, once you get to that point, where they should not have access to everything, where their user identity really matters because they only need to see what's you know, germane to them. So a lot of those pieces have been uh, put in place here as well. Um, here's a quote uh, from this one. Um, again, lots of good quotes. I always have to just sort of pick one. Um, and so this is the result of um, you know, kind of what's been going on. This one's been underway for about a year, coming up on a year. Okay, so that takes us to kind of the, the um, end steps of this. Do I need a virtual vault? Here are a bunch of questions to ask yourself. And Jen and I were kind of kidding. If you can answer yes to at least three of these, you need a virtual vault. Um, so first is, you know, where's your content? Neatly stacked up or all over the place? It's all over the place, might need a virtual vault. Um, this is a biggie. Can you find the content you need? And I would add to that, can you find it rapidly and efficiently? Um, because if it takes an expert three days, you can find it, but that's not a very smart use of resources. Um, so there's the, yeah, so efficiently and uh, quickly. Do you know what you're missing? Do you have it all? Do you have that sneaky suspicion that there's probably more out there? Um, this is a biggie also. Um, simple search tends to uh, often miss the most recent or the most germane version. Um, this is really important when you're dealing with contracts and amendments and um, also with correspondence. You really want to be able to not only get the most recent and final one, but probably the, uh, the history and the chronology of that activity over time. So you really want to be able to see it all as well as latest, best, most pertinent, etc. Um, is the content that you are erstwhile responsible for a risk? Um, and if you don't know the answer to that, ask your legal department and the answer will be yes. <laughs> uh, because anything, if you ask legal about risk, the answer is yes. Um, this is a big one. Um, are you performing this search or this retrieval or this analysis effort on a regular basis? Even if it's once a quarter, uh, it, as soon as you are kind of repeating your activity, it does, that, I don't mean you're doing the same search every day. I mean that you are searching. Um, if you are finding yourself doing kind of repetitive tasks like that, those are really good setups for automation. A, a virtual vault is going to really make your life better. And then finally, is there a collective need? It's probably not just legal asking for information. There's probably a compliance reason. It's probably a records reason, you know, business line. Um, again, the more kind of um, voices heard from, the more likely you're going to be able to essentially prove an ROI. 
And so here we go. How do you prove an ROI? I gave you a couple hints earlier, um, but this is it kind of laid out in a nutshell. Um, start with a pilot. Um, we can certainly help you identify pilots that are going to have a big impact, that are going to have a great return, um, and that are likely to kind of play well uh, inside your organizations. We have a lot of experience with this by now. Um, we also, very important that you don't just do a pilot in a vacuum. The pilot should be always looking forward. The pilot should be a real world use case. It should be live documents that uh, if it pans out, you would literally use the pilot and step forward from there. That's very much the model that we use um, so that the pilot is not just a, hey, can you do this? It's literally the cornerstone for future work. Make sure, and we talked about this a little bit too, make sure you measure the results, okay? And this is very important. Start by measuring before the pilot begins. What are you doing now and how long does it take? For example, the uh, case study one that we talked about, the HRMNA, they did uh, benchmark themselves how long it took to respond to a legal request. It took them four days and three people working for four days. So essentially 12 person days to respond to a legal request. Now, when we do it, I think the most recent run was nine seconds. So just do that ROI. And then finally, of course, build on the success. As I said, it, this is actually really easy. People tend to pile onto virtual vaults because they sort of have that, oh, thank God, kind of factor to them. Um, so I, I, in my experience, the where to next is going to suggest itself while you are going. Uh, while you get that pilot underway, uh, people are going to be looking over your shoulder. They are going to be the next cases. Now I got to move this. And then finally, spread the word. Sharing is caring. That's Jen. Um, it, this is true. What, what we see, the organizations that do the best with something like this are those that have internal showcases. Um, they'll have like a demo day or a... Um, Somebody in the organization will demonstrate the capabilities to somebody else in the organization. We're happy to help you with that, but the best way to kind of spread the word is for you to share it with your colleagues. You're gonna have a lot more credibility in your organization than I am. Um, we're happy to help you do that, but we have found that those kind of uh, demo day type things really help bring other parties on board. All right, we're just about up at the hour. Um, thank you all for staying. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, very interested in your thoughts. And we hope that you will leave us a comment or leave us a question and that we'll hear from you in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it was pretty good timing. We've got two minutes left. So um, we'll just keep it open there for, for question and answer. Um, I would invite everyone, um, if you think of a question after the fact, please feel free to contact either Sandy or myself and our emails are there on the screen. Um, also, I'd invite you to book a demo. If you wanna get on our website at valoratech.com and, and you can either complete the form there to book a demo and we'll, um, we'll actually, we'll talk and brainstorm about your specific use case and then kind of show you how it would look in and black cat in that user interface kind of pertaining to your your situation what you're trying to achieve um, i'd also invite you to uh, follow us on uh, linkedin and follow us on twitter and register for any other upcoming webinar series that might pique your interest so thank you everyone um, for today and again let us know if you've got any questions thanks enjoy your day <laughs>